There appears to be some kind of amusement park over here. I am at DesignerCon in beautiful Anaheim, California. And if I'm being honest, I'm not really sure what I'm looking for here. I certainly have a lot of hope, a lot of things that I am looking to see. But for the most part, I'm going into this thing largely blind about what to expect and what I'm going to find there and, and what questions it's going to raise for me. So let's jump in and take a look at the floor and, and see what there is to see at DesignerCon. Okay, I definitely think I have a much better grasp on what designer con is now and whew. So if I had to sum it up in just a couple of words, designer con, as opposed to any of the other fairs or conventions that I've ever been to, designer con is full of people who are making to sell. Everybody there is they're here to make their money back because they had to buy the booths. Nobody here got in for free. They all had to design or they all had to make their booths. So they had to make their money back. But some people were making much more than that back here. And as I went around, I had a question for people. I wanted to know whether this was their full-time job or whether this was something that they did on the side. And as I started to ask people this question, I actually got pretty good at predicting what their answer was going to be just looking at what they had on their booth. And what do you think the difference was between those two groups of people? So the groups of people who do this full-time, do you think that they're the people who, instead of making stuff themselves, produces it and then sends it to a factory to make. No, well, no, not really. My friend, Ginger Drop Labs, she was here and everything she makes is handmade out of ceramics by herself. Everything, now she does use mold so that she can make a lot of them at a time, but everything that she sells is handmade, hand painted, they're her own designs and she does this full time. I even found a table where somebody was selling cinder wings dragons they weren't even designs that he made but he's doing this full time so no it's not about the manufacturing process that matters the only thing that mattered was how much stuff they had to sell i would look at a table and if it was sparse uh, this was somebody who maybe they had a creative job in their main job but this was kind of a creative outlet for their own ideas or you know this was just something that they did for fun on the side and hey, if they made back the money for that they spent on getting the table that was great to them but then the people whose tables were absolutely packed with product who had lots and lots of things to sell those were the people who were doing this full time so is that it if you want to go pro all you need to do is have a lot of stuff to sell well, I think that that's definitely an important part of the equation and certainly something that I have been needing to figure out because to have a lot of stuff to sell, you have to, one, always be creating. If your 3D printer is not running, get it running, get it making something. But then there's also storage. And this has been a bit of a problem for me is where do I put all the stuff that I make? Where do I put my stock of stuff to sell before it sells? And one thing that I always thought that 3D printing would do for us is reduce the amount of stock that we need to have. We wouldn't need to have warehouses full of stuff to sell waiting for somebody to sell it to. And to a certain degree, that's still true, but you do need to have a certain amount of stuff to sell, even if it's just enough for one fair or convention. Now, some people were a little bit willing to talk about the numbers to me. And one of the things that they told me is that a 10 by 10 table at these fairs costs about $1,300. Now those are the big ones and a lot of people had smaller ones. And the smaller ones are whatever fraction of that that they used, but that gives you some idea of you can't expect to, to go here and just do it casually. If you wanna go pro, you have to go pro. You have to 
be willing to always be creating, always being making something, always being making new products. And that is one thing that I haven't really conquered yet. So I think that's gonna be my focus, but I think that there's more to it than that. I also think though, that you need to have an identity, that you need to have a brand, you need to have something that that makes people want what you have. And for a lot of people here, it was the weird and the bizarre, and it's this is the stuff that, that your parents wouldn't let you play with as a kid, but now we're a grown up so we can do it, and that's fine. There were also a lot of people here that were selling things that were just gorgeous, just beautiful, um, but it needs to have that polish. And I'm thinking for some of the things that I'm designing, print -a blocks and cheap -a malls and things like that, that telling the story of the lore of them will be a good lure for them. The lore is a lure. I just came up with that while I was recording this. But that's the idea. If I could somehow convey a story and get people interested in the story, I've got to think of ways to do that. Uh, Steven, thank you so much for your thoughts. I just had a talk, chance to talk with Steven Silver. He is the guy who drew Kim Possible. He designed Kim Possible. And I had some, some questions, some thoughts about him. Because if you look around this place, so many people's works are based on existing IPs. They're, they're making their own artwork, but based on the ideas that are owned by other people. Here's a good example of this. I mean, you know, that's that's not, you, you recognize the character. Hey, that's uh, Yo Gabba Gabba. But I asked him like, you know, really that's not their work is, is, don't you have a problem with that? And he was like, well, it's not my work either. It's Disney's, Disney owns it. Yes, I drew it and stuff like that. And I said, well, does that technically mean that if you make uh, a Kim Possible drawing like the ones that you're selling there that it's fan art and he was like yeah I guess so and the thing about doing fan art unlicensed uh, um, works based on other people's IP is that you are limiting your success if you do that because the worst thing that can happen if you're doing fan art is that you become successful enough that you get the attention of the IP owner and they sue Well, I've had some time to unpack from my experience at DesignerCon in more ways than one. And I think that the big lesson from DesignerCon for me has been, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's possible. There are people who are making a creative living, making toys. They found their audience and they're making it work. And so it's possible. It's not just a pipe dream. It's something that's achievable. Now, I don't know how many of those people are making enough to support a family of six. There were a few people that had a whole studio. So clearly, if you've got employees, you're doing okay. So it's possible. And, you know, maybe if I, I put enough hustle and, and put enough effort into it, this could be a reality for me. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming along with me on this journey and an extra special thanks to everybody who supports what I do on printables, fangs, or Patreon, where I periodically release premium 3D print models for you to check out. The latest model that I released is this fun little remix of the Skyforce Starwing, this time adding a little Anthromidian Lion Pilot on the inside. It's a fun project, a fun print to put together. Plus, you can take it apart and remix it into whatever you can imagine. But that's it for this video. I want to remind you that you are a child of God, so you're special to me. So take care of yourself, and if you can, someone else too. I'll see you next time.